I am the project lead for SDSNU Solutions Program, and I will be your host today. Before we start, I would like to introduce Chef Dan Barber, one of New York's most noted chefs, co-owner of restaurants Blue Hill and Blue Hill at Stone Barns, and the author of the book, The Third Plate, Field Notes on the Future of Food, who will be doing the opening remarks for our session. Chef Dan, over to you. Ah, there we are. Okay. How's that? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you fine. Okay. I'm sorry for that. Uh, good evening, and thank you for that introduction, and thank you for having me tonight. I have to say I have a, a mixed feelings about being sitting here with you this moment. I'm very happy to uh, introduce this segment. I'm also introducing a segment because I'm not uh, with a restaurant, my restaurant anymore. I'd usually be uh, standing in the kitchen and cooking dinner service uh, right now at 6.30 at the height of dinner service, so it's bittersweet. Uh uh, Dan, we yep. could see you for a second, although now we cannot. Can you click your video camera button one more time? Sorry. There you go. Thank you. Okay. So do I need to repeat myself or you were hearing that? No, nope, we were hearing you. Go ahead. No, we can hear you. Okay. 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 So I am thrilled to to be at home with my kids and I just cooked some dinner for them, some spring vegetables. And I was thinking about the last time that I visited the Brooklyn Grange, which was uh, I think a year ago, and had an amazing experience uh, in the heart of the city, looking at uh, well manicured soil, healthy soil, healthy and delicious vegetables, uh, and a crew of energetic and spirited um, young people who were devoted to the cause, and the cause being that uh, we want a future of delicious um, and nutritious food for ourselves and for our children, it's very simple. And we are the youth uh, that I that I met at the Brooklyn Grange, and I've met um, several times people who who work as part of this project are part of the refugia. They are part of the future of a food system that refuse to uh, give in to the interests of big, powerful multinationals that do not have the interests of nutrition and deliciousness in mind. They have the interests of, of yield and of profits in mind. Uh, and that's a crude way to give um, an encapsulation of our current situation, but it's as simple as that. It's very binary. It's your food choices are, in the words of, of the great writer Michael Pollan, a uh, way to vote three times a day. Uh, and what the Brooklyn Grange does for you is it allows this experiment in the midst of New York City to blossom. Uh, now, will it feed New York City? Are we are we imagining that rooftop gardening is the answer to the future of our food system because it's less um, tra transportation, um, it's grown right there, you can watch it grow, and therefore that's the ticket to the future? No. Uh, I don't think anyone who works at Brooklyn Grange actually feels that way either. Um, the the uh, promise of a garden in the middle of the city is the promise of connection. It's about a relationship that we all have to food and we all have to the planet Earth, which we're celebrating today. And that is a gift in the middle of, of an urban environment to experience that, a real gift. Um, and now in this moment, in this, this crazy pandemic moment, we all have a new, hopefully a, a, a new and renewed um, relationship with food uh, because we're all at home and because we are now forced to cook in ways that we were never forced to cook. And we are creating in ourselves and in our families that consciousness and that connection to food. And all of a sudden questions get, get to be asked, well, how was this grown and where did it come from? How did it get to me? Who was the farmer who was growing it? And on and on. Questions like that are so healthy. And what is so important about urban gardens and urban agriculture is not that they are a practical solution to the problems. They are one good solution that that whose power is about the gift of consciousness and relationship because 
the, 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 the power that the big food chain holds over us is they relationship. They make it harder to see. Uh, and they thrive on that. They take a fake story. Uh, and so we all now in this day and this day moving forward and as we circle out of this, uh, this devastating time for the farm to table movement, we need to all dig in deeper to the relationship in a way that uh, focuses our attention on the challenges for the future. Uh, I'll, I'll leave you with this point. I, if I had been talking to you all five weeks ago, and I had said, you know, the strongest food chain you could possibly engage in and support is the shortest chain. It's the farm to table chain because it's the farmer shakes the hand of the person who's buying the food and cooking the food and putting it on their plate. And therefore, has a strong argument for the kind of food chain they want for the future because the industrial food chain is a long chain. So anywhere that breaks, you have weakness. And you all would have, you know, applauded in your own way and said, yeah, that's that's right. That's why we need to dig into this. Well, here we are today, now six weeks after that that imaginary conversation, and what's happened? Well, the farm table movement actually isn't looking as strong as it might have six weeks ago. And what COVID has done is is reveal a weakness. And while I've opened this segment by trumpeting the potential of of urban gardening and 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 this increased consciousness and relationship with food, I also want to leave you with a challenge. And the challenge is we have to move beyond the simplistic connection between a farm and a table. That's the biggest lesson for me and my takeaway as a farm to table chef, as a, as a chef who's sitting with a table in the middle of a farm actually is, is what I am. Um, I've got a stake in the game and what I have come to realize is that, is that a pandemic like this quickly exposes the weakness, the Achilles heel of the farm table movement because you, you cannot shake the hand of the farmer that that raise your food. Um, you, you get a virus, in other words. And that that is a new paradigm of understanding. And what does it do for us? It challenges us not to accept that big, clean agriculture is the future. No, the, the, the uh, way forward is complicating the picture and using the farm to table model as the model to spring forward, using a urban garden as a sense of a relationship that needs to be protected. And how do we protect it? Well, in this COVID environment, one way to think about protecting it is to introduce more processors. You know, it turns out the farm to table could use a few more middlemen. Um, because if we had middlemen, if we had middlemen and middle women, maltsters, distillers, fermenters, picklers, canners, cheese makers, and all the way through the system, we do not need to think about food processing and the way the American uh, uh, corporations think about food processing. We ought to think about it on a regional and on a distinctive level. And that is the greatest chain that we could uh, enact, build on, uh, support in the connection between a farm and a table. We ought to build out a real food economy. And a real food economy is inefficient compared to the big chain, of course, inefficient, uh, but it's resilient and it's multifaceted. And in an environment of a pandemic and a breakdown, a devastation, you have the strength of a regional food economy to supply uh, nutrition and, and again, deliciousness. And I, I wanna end with deliciousness because that's, the, that's the, um, the keystone part of this. If we don't value food for its flavor, then, it's, then food, is, food is fuel becomes the next uh, sentence out of your mouth. And food is fuel is a dangerous concept, and we know that. Uh, and what we need to do is take the, the, the food that these farmers in our local regional food shed are growing and make them more valuable to the farmer through, through honoring the true cost of growing food in the right way. And then we need to honor it for our bodies. And that means processing it and making the nutrition and the flavor, deliciousness, more bioavailable to us, more celebratory for us. And that is a delicious future that I feel, even in this moment of, of weakness and, and of despair in many ways, um, I feel a sense of hope because we do have an opportunity to reset uh, an answer to, to the food chain that, that dogs us, dogs us nutritionally and environmentally. Uh, and, and now's the moment to dig in harder than ever so I leave you with that hope and that that um, that promise that 
that for this movement to to become not just the most exciting social movement which it has of the last 10 years but to circle into a food movement that actually has market share that's formidable uh we we need new processes uh, to take the food and make it more valuable for the farmer and for ourselves. Uh, but it has to start with the farming. It has to start with the soil. It has to start with the connection and a relationship to a farm. And that's where I'm going to give you the Brooklyn Grange to learn more about that uh, and to celebrate all their success. And, and I wish them well, and I wish all of you well in this, this, uh, in this very strange and in many ways distressing moment. Uh, but I, I think of a lot of hope uh, when it comes to food and our future. Uh, and I thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you, Chef, for your most valuable contribution today. We could not be happier for that, and we could not agree more.